Well, good evening. It's good to be with you again. After I'd finished preparing my sermon for today, um, I received the weekly news from Christian Institute. Now, I don't know if any of you get the news from the Christian Institute. Uh, it is worth reading if, if you're online. Um, but there were so many stories in it which uh, are really referenced by the things that I've already put in my sermon. So I thought I would just highlight one or two of them for you. Um, the government is claiming that their conversion ban therapy uh, bill will not outlaw discussions on gender so that uh, churches will continue to be free to discuss these sort of issues. Um, but there are, there are fears that the, uh, the, the transgender and, and uh, homosexual lobby will pressure the government to give way. The Liberal Democrat uh, leader has declared that men can be women. The Canadian bioethicists, i.e. those people who um, uh, look at the ethics of biology, now claim that poverty is grounds for committing euthanasia. So if you're poor, you should be euthanized. Churches in, the, in America, in California, have been awarded damages for being forced in the past to provide funds for abortion. Um, a, a lobby group which is teaching sex education in schools um, has uh, had to apologise for uh, links on its website which highlight that some of the people going into schools are into uh, pornography. Um, a Northern Ireland uh, goalkeeper has highlighted the great dangers of gambling. And a teacher in a, in a Welsh school, the Bishop of Landuff School of, in Wales, has been sacked because he asked about his personal views on, uh, on marriage at a, a, a staff training session where he was encouraged to believe that uh, it was a safe space to ask or discuss any matters to do with uh, the transgender agenda. And he merely said, you know, what, what are your views on my Christian view that marriage is between one man and one woman? And he was sacked for that. So we live in a very difficult world, but we thank God that he is the one who rules over all. And so we'll come to him in prayer now. Heather's now going to come and bring us our reading, which is Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. 
Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Thank you. In Genesis 1 and 2, there is no sin. Sin arrives in Genesis chapter 3. In Revelation 20, there is the final judgment of sin. And so in Revelation 21 and 22, there is no sin. But the marks of sin persist into eternity because Jesus bears the marks of the suffering for our sin. They are there to mark his suffering and his love for us. They will forever tell of the price of our forgiveness. We will not be able to forget, nor should we want to. But between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20 is the story of sin and of redemption. With sin came suffering. Women would have the pain of childbirth. The ground, the world, bears the curse of sin. So mankind will toil hard to earn a living. These things affect all mankind. But it is not until revelation that the final judgment comes with the sentence of eternal suffering for the devil who stirred Adam and Eve to sin and those who have not sought God's mercy, who remain in rebellion to his rule, they too will share the same fate. It is at this point that all wrongs will be set right. Justice will prevail eternally. God's people will be finally free from all the troubles caused by sin. And God's people will dwell with God forever in harmony with one another and in harmony with a new heaven and a new earth. Tonight, I want to look at what happens between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20. It's a big story, so we will only be taking a brief look at one strand of that story. The strand we're going to look at is the relationship between sin and suffering. We will not have time to look at all aspects. There will inevitably be much that is not said. But hopefully we will see enough to build a clear picture, a picture that you can build on in your own private study. But there is one fixed point that we must establish before we attempt to look at this big picture. It is the point of Calvary. This overall story revolves around that point. Whatever else is said this evening, Calvary is critical to understanding the big picture. In sinning against God, rebelling against God's command, Adam and Eve fell under God's just judgment. The sentence for sin is death, spiritual death, separation from God forever. Because they, and all Adam and Eve's descendants, have become contaminated by sin, there is nothing that we can do to be restored to God. But we've already noted that the final judgment does not come until Revelation 20, just before the new heavens and the new earth appear. Why is that? Is God stringing us along, twisting the screws before he sends us to eternal punishment? No. We've already said that in Revelation 21 and 22, there is a redeemed people of God who dwell with God forever. Who are these people? How did they get there if we are subject to judgment? Paul sets out the answer for us clearly and succinctly in Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. God held off from judgment for two reasons. First, he planned to provide a means of rescue through the sacrifice of his own son for mankind. Second, he is giving mankind time to repent and trust in Jesus, to have faith in his means of salvation. And so we're going to look at two points. Sin brings suffering. Repentance overcomes suffering. So first, sin brings suffering. We've already made the general point that Adam and Eve's sin brought a curse on the world and alienated mankind from God. Sin is therefore the direct or indirect cause of all suffering in the world. We live in a fallen world and it is not until the world is renewed that this will change. Then in the new heavens and a new earth all will be well. God will dwell with his people. There will be no more sickness, no more suffering, no more death. God will wipe away every tear from our eye. The lion will lie down with the lamb. Peace and joy will reign. So it's a difficult, difficult point to make, but the Bible is clear. Some of the suffering of our world is a direct result of our sin. There are other causes too. In particular, there is the evil that Satan works against us. And there is the evil that others do against us in their own sinful acts. But we cannot escape the truth that God from time to time rebukes the people of this world for their evil. Leaving aside the wider consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, in Genesis 4, we see that God warns Cain about sin which seeks to take hold of him. But still Cain kills his brother. God then marks Cain in some way and he is driven out to be a wanderer. The ground is cursed because of him, so Cain can no longer farm. His sin is significant. So is his punishment. It is not simply this matter uh, will be settled in eternity, which it will be. God is making clear Cain's sin is great. He is warning other people, warning us. The tragedy is the significance of this sin and its punishment has been lost on many. So even in the same chapter, chapter 4 of Genesis, we see Lamech boasting about his killing of other men. The downward spiral of sin has set in. And in a relatively short time, it has produced a situation God is no longer able to tolerate. While saving righteous Noah and his family, God destroys the rest of mankind in a global flood. Later in Genesis, we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cry of the suffering of those uh, who suffered at the hands of the, the people of so Sodom and Gomorrah. Their cry goes up to before God. The sin of these cities was so great, God felt compared to destroy them entirely with fire and brimstone. And their destruction has become proverbial as a judgment of God on evil. But remember, God also specifically put individuals to death because of their evil. In Genesis 38, verses 6 and 7, we read, 
Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. And then we read in verse 10, we find that uh, God similarly put Ur's brother Onan to death because of his wickedness too. This is not an isolated case. We might think about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus. They failed to obey the instructions that they had been given about the tabernacle ceremonies. Their actions offended the holiness of God and the fire of God consumed them. And then in number 16, there is the story of Korah's rebellion, where 250 community leaders rebelled against Moses' leadership. Most were similarly destroyed by the fire of God, but three were destroyed when the ground opened up underneath them. But punishment is not reserved uh, to the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira conspired to falsely gain standing in the early church by deceiving the church about the gift that they'd given to help uh, meet the, the financial needs of the church and its people. They kept back part of the money from the property they sold, but they lied about giving all the income from the sale to the church. Both were struck down dead. And also in Acts, we read in chapter 12, verses 21 to 23, that God dealt with Herod. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 28 to 30, Paul claims that dishonouring of the Lord's Supper has produced sickness and death amongst God's people. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. These incidents are all part of a much larger picture. God does not just zap individuals every time they displease him, as we saw from Romans 3. But he does not do it in isolation either. Solomon's prayer of dedication at the temple is worth considering. Solomon recognised the significance of the temple that he built to honour God. It is to be a permanent focus for the people of God and their, uh, their relationship with him. God has chosen these descendants of Abraham to be his own people. His desire was that they should live to glorify him, to make his name known to other nations. But we saw earlier how how witness uh, to others had to reflect the holiness of God. So when God gave his law through Moses, God made it clear that if they failed to protect the honour of his name, he would punish his people. And it was those warnings that then form a key part of Solomon's prayer. The prayer talks about the times when Israel might be defeated because they have sinned. Similarly, it talks about drought, plague, plagues of locusts, exile. All these things are to be recognised as judgments sent by God because of the sins of the nation. And Old Testament history goes on to speak of these things as punishments for God's wayward people because of their sin. Sin is not to be treated lightly. 
We cannot defy God and expect God to simply shrug his shoulders. God is God. He is holy, a jealous God, a God of anger against the sin of mankind in, in general. But he will be particularly grieved by the sins of his own people. Romans 1 is an apt warning for our times. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. This is not just saying that ultimately God will punish such wickedness. Paul goes on. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And then later, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. The rejection of the knowledge of God results in God removing the constraints, the constraints on people's lives. And consequently, they seep deeper, deeper into sin. The evils of our society increase because of this vicious cycle in rejecting God results in him removing the restraining, his restraining hand upon our evil lives. There is a classic case of this in the Old Testament with the plagues of Egypt. Pharaoh's rejection of the word of God brought punishment to the whole land. But we also read that God further hardened the heart of Pharaoh to display his glory and his righteous judgment, his power and his rule. And ultimately, Pharaoh is destroyed. There is much more that we could say on this topic, but we need to move on to our second point. Repentance overcomes suffering. We are probably all familiar with the story of David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. God sends Nathan to confront David with his sin. Nathan also pronounces God's sentence of punishment. David repents. But God then does not just brush the matter off. David's sin still has its consequences. His son dies. Absalom initiates a civil war. But Psalm 51 has some important features. And some commentators link Psalm 32 with this incident too, as a psalm reviewing the outcome of David's repentance in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 highlights how, because of his sin, David has lost his joy and his security in God. He pleads for restoration, for cleansing. Verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Verses 11 and 12. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In his sin, David no longer has peace, but seeks restoration. 
He has confidence in God that God is loving and merciful and that with God there is forgiveness, that there can be a renewal of fellowship through genuine repentance. God is not looking for pointless sacrifices. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that will pay for David's sin, as the book of Hebrews explains so well. Even if Psalm 32 is not directly connected with the events of Psalm 51, Psalm 32 clearly sets out the brokenness of sin, verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. What David seems to be describing is the experience of so many in our society today. Suicide is the biggest cause of death amongst teenagers. Day by day, our media, in our media, there are pleas about the inadequacy of mental health services for school children and those in their 20s. Pressure is mounting for universities to may be made legally responsible for the welfare of students. What is the cause of these issues? It is the rejection of eternal structures put in place by God in creation. It is the rejection of the rule of God. It is the pressure created by social media. For years we have known about the pressure on girls who, uh, to appear like the airbrushed images of the idols of their popular culture. But recently I saw a television interview with a young man who had been receiving help with his mental health because of dysmorphia, body dysmorphic or disorder, to give it its full title. Again, his in interaction with social media led him to hate his own body because he didn't have the body of the macho characters that he idolised. Week by week, we hear of one campaign or another to help stop uh, uh, suicide. But only the Bible offers an eternal comfort. Yet Christian values are ignored and rejected. But at the same time, there are those who are campaigning vigorously for assisted suicide. How do we reconcile these two issues? Those campaigning for assisted suicide would probably claim that they are only wanting to cover those that are already terminally ill. But if you look abroad at those countries that have already legalised assisted suicide, the broadening of criteria for assistance has grown rapidly. Yet when we read Psalm 32, we find an answer to these problems. Verse 5. Then I will acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. The problem of our society of people not having security disappears when we confess our sins to God. Verse 7. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And look to at verse 10. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. But our society has rejected such things. It has rejected the science of biological manhood and womanhood. And even suggesting that these things are real can now get you into real trouble. We might have little in common with J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter stories, but we can sympathise with her. There are those who run a vicious campaign against her because she has stood up for biological womanhood. 
In contrast, we have seen that there are headlines in the media over the last year about the Labour Party who seem incapable of defining what a woman is. Scotland too has got itself embroiled in the same problem over a man transitioning to a woman, uh, to be a woman who uh, has committed sexual offences against women and has had to be transferred from a female prison to a male prison. This week, a Christian teacher has been banned from teaching for misgendering a pupil, merely calling a, what, a, what he took, because he was teaching in a girls' school, what he, he took to be a girl, called her she, um, and she, the, the pupil objected to this. But the whole issue of gender, or none, is just one example of the dysfunctionality of a society which promotes the myth that we can do, that we can achieve anything we want, that we are the masters of our destiny, the captains of our soul. Twenty or more years ago, business management theory was pushing the idea that we should allow people to make mistakes, that we should allow people to learn from such experiences that they would grow and develop through them. But look at the pressures that schools are creating on, on pupils. I remember hearing of a child of children who are being told that they must succeed in their A-levels because this was the one opportunity that they had to set the course of their lives. What utter nonsense. At the same time, we hear of people like Jay Blades who confronted his inability to read and gained a decree, a degree. But at the age of 50, he's learning to read. Rejection of eternal truths has been replaced by a quicksand of narrow-minded personal ideas, self-belief and self-direction. David learned lessons from his sin and the confession of his sin. In love, he wants to teach others the eternal truths that he's discovered. Verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. But he also has a warning for those who reject his lessons. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Or in other words, learning the lesson of the ages, or these problems will haunt you until you are forced to conform. And that applies at a societal level as much as it does at the personal level. I often wonder if people have forgotten the old story of the emperor's new clothes as I hear of some of the bizarre things that are going on in our society. Earlier, we noted how the world is under the curse of sin, how trouble comes on us because of that curse. But I also highlighted how Satan stirs up evil against people. There are many examples in the Bible. Perhaps the classic example is the story of Job. But in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus highlighted that persecution comes to God's people just as it did to the prophets who were persecuted throughout the Old Testament. We spoke earlier about Herod, and we can think of his actions too against the early church and how he persecuted them. Troubles do not cease when we turn to God in repentance. But our new relationship with God gives different perspectives on suffering. With an eternal perspective, our view of our light and momentary troubles, as Paul describes them in 2 Corinthians 4.17, these things need not trouble us in the same way that they trouble those who do not trust in the God who rules eternally. Similarly, 
Paul highlights in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 that Christians do not grieve in the same way over the death of other Christians as the world grieves over those who die with no hope. So how do we conclude? Sin is the rebellion against the rule of God. Being in a state of enmity with the eternal God will bring problems in this world and disaster in the world to come. Our government has sought to legislate to give individuals the right to be whatever they want to be in their confused state of rebellion against God. But our government has not worked out how to reconcile the conflict that such legislation creates. I suggest to you that the only real solution is the one that David found. End the suffering. Repent. Trust in the eternal rule of the eternal God, the God of love and mercy. The problem is we cannot force other people to accept our position, but I want you to hold two truths closely. First, have confidence in the gospel of Christ. It continues to be the only way of salvation. It is the only way to be reconciled to the eternal God. It is a gospel of peace, a gospel of comfort and security. It is a gospel of transformation. Therefore, keep proclaiming the gospel. Second, recognise that even though we may be persecuted because of our stand for God's truth that is rejected by the rest of, these world, well, the, rest of the world, these truths stand for eternity. If you have put your trust in the forgiveness of the crucified Christ at Calvary, you have nothing to fear. As Martin Luther put it, and though this world with devil's fear filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever.